Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Esri GeoDev webinar series. We started this series as a way to continue engaging in developer-related topics and discussions in between Dev Summits. Along with our developer summits, we also have our annual user conference coming up July 12th through 15th. This year, we are hosting the event virtually, and we'll have an ArcGIS platform for developers track, so be sure to check it out if you do attend. Moving forward in continuation of our GeoDev webinar series, we will continue to have new topics, advanced features, and additional functionality to share with you, so be sure to stay connected with us through our GeoDev webinar series page or any of our social media accounts at Esri GeoDev. We would love to have conversations like these taking place throughout the year so that when we do meet at one of these Dev Summit conferences, it will be as though we never stopped. We hope you get as much or more out of this webinar than you anticipated. Now we would like to introduce you to today's webinar, Introduction to the ArcGIS Survey123 Web App JavaScript API. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. But if you would prefer to join over the phone, just, use, just select Use Telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce our presenter, James Tedrick. Let's get started, shall we, James? Thank you, Amy. Hi there. Um, as Amy mentioned, I'm James Tedrick. I'm a product engineer for the ArcGIS Survey123 application. And today, we're going to be introducing you to the ArcGIS Survey123 Web App JS API, JavaScript API. Um, so, uh, hopefully, uh, you'll have some familiarity with Survey123 and some familiarity with JavaScript, but that's not required for, but it's not absolutely required for this uh, for this session. So just to begin, um, as I mentioned, I hopefully you have some familiarity with ArcGIS Survey123, but if you don't, just wanted to introduce what Survey123 is. Survey123 is a location-aware form-based solution that ties in with the ArcGIS platform. It supports both field collection with a mobile application available on iOS, Android, Windows, as well as a web form component that can be used with any browser uh, on a device. Uh, and that could be a mobile browser on a phone or the desktop browser on your laptop or desktop. Survey123 helps make the form collection process more efficient by allowing you to provide rules and other smart form capabilities that reduce the amount of errors that occur when manual, when filling in a form as compared to a manual fill-in, be able to offload calculations that a person may need to do on a piece of paper into the form itself automatically, uh, and then also systematically allows you to submit, have the user submit their data into a feature service, a already existing table of information so that you know you don't have to fill in the form in pencil and then come back in the office and retype it in uh, into a database. It all goes straight from the user into that database. For the JavaScript API, we're going to be focusing on the web form. Uh, that makes sense as it is the web app JS API. So as I mentioned, we support collecting uh, web forms with pretty much every browser that's supported by uh, most platform manufacturers nowadays. Uh, and you can easily create a form either using the Survey123 website or our desktop tool, Survey123 Connect, and publish that form and have it be filled in over the web. Uh, in particular, we see a number of users that are creating public forms uh, that uh, are that they want to have a member of the public, not somebody within their organization, collect data. For example, damage assessments, as you see from the tweet uh, within the from the city of Stillwater, uh, or the Texas assessment tool that you see the screenshot here for. To help support that, um, we make it fairly easy for a user after they've published a form 
to begin to embed it into their website. So to the right of the screen here, uh, you see the embedding options that are available from the Survey123 webpage. And you can see that we basically provide you the code that you would need to put into your uh, web page, and then a few options such as showing the theme or description or um, options bar um, so that uh, you can control the layout a little bit so it integrates well with your own uh, website. So that's out of the box without requiring any code. We do see people, uh, when we talk with our customers, we do see a need to extend beyond what we can provide out of the box. Uh, so here I've listed a few different cases for why we might extend Survey123, either the field app or in the web application. So again, providing additional custom business logic, for example, uh, integrating with other applications. Uh, and that's actually will be the focus of this seminar is to use that to use the web app JS API to integrate a Survey123 form into another web application. Also, uh, we've seen need to uh, automate processes or better blend with a uh, you know with the corporate identity of a of an organization, the logos, the theme, even the font, you know that type of thing. Make make the form look like it's a native page, if you will, of a particular organization. To address these needs, Survey123 has many different techniques to extend what we provide out of the box. Oops, sorry. To extend what we provide out of the box uh, and allow you to essentially add on to that uh, add on to that form, whether it is uh, custom styling through themes uh, or, in, as I said, embedding into a web application, which is our focus for the day or providing custom business logic through custom JavaScript functions. So as I mentioned today, we are working on, we will be focusing on embedding a form into an existing web app. And that's the heart of the JS API. I'll also note that as part of the GeoDev uh, webinar series, we also have recently done presentations on using Python to help automate parts of Survey123 workflows as well as using custom JavaScript functions to create custom business logic. If you're interested in those, they are available in the GeoDev webinar archives, um, so you can view those at your leisure. So let's begin and focus on the Web App JS API. So as I mentioned, the Web App, the Survey123 Web App JS API allows us to embed a Survey123 Web App or form inside another web application that you author. So it's you know taking your application and then integrating a, a form with that application so that the logic of your application drives the lifecycle of that form. Some use cases there uh, that we see are again applying custom CSS styling to further enhance or modify the look and feel of a form beyond what we allow for out of the box. Being able to interact with the data as a user enters it into the form with your application or have your application add data into the form itself, as well as uh, be able to have your application respond to various events during a form's life cycle. And by the life cycle, I'm including the form creation, so that's that on form loaded, um, as well as the user interacting with the form. So when a question value changes, that's that on value change that you see there listed, as well as when a form is submitted. So that's that on form submitted. So being able to, you know, the life cycle of a user filling out the form, not necessarily the programmatic life cycle of the form itself, but as a user is filling out a form, those events being able to interact with. To give you an idea of this, I actually want to go to another ArcGIS application, Experience Builder, and show how they've integrated Survey123 using the Web App JS API into Experience Builder. So I'm going to go here to this Experience Builder. It's a fairly simple one. I have a, a map here, uh, and in this case, you see we have San Diego parking meters. And to the right, I've got a form. And you can see that this form is loaded pretty much in a, in a no data state, right? There's no information here. And the map is basically just centered at the same location as this map. So I'm going to just zoom over 
nervous pan over and click on this meter right here. You see it's a little bit distinctive. It's at a little parking lot location. And when I clicked on that, you can see that the form has now filled in with the information of that meter. It's in the uptown neighborhood, which looking at the legend, that's correct. Apparently this particular neighborhood is called Bankers Hill. And we've got the meter location on Grape Street. We can confirm that with the map. You can see that we're in the same location. We even receive the poll ID and the meter's configuration. So we've already pre-populated this form with a lot of the information that a user would need in order to be able to get started. We can then go in and continue to fill in this inspection. Let's say that this is in fair condition. And we can say that the payment receptacle is jammed. And we'll just say that somebody put some chewing gum in the coin slot, which would be a really annoying thing to fix. But it's not something that we would need to worry about replacing the entire meter for. I don't actually have any photos, so I'll ignore that for now and submit. So I had half the form filled out for me. I submitted, I have the submission, and you can see once it's submitted, it actually refreshes and is ready for me to go in and fill in the information on my next form. And you can see as I click from location to location in the map, the form updates with that information. Go down into the downtown area, and we now have that downtown area. So we can see that this map here is very well integrated with the form. Whenever the map action occurs, the form is updated to reflect the events of that map action. Looking at the design of this, this is, a, again, a fairly simple uh, you know, uh, experience builder. There's only two widgets involved. We have the web map here. You can just see that we have the map and the survey. So I added a map widget. And then in the pre-built widgets that come with Experience Builder, I added a survey widget. If I click on the survey widget to get its configuration, you can see that I have selected the survey that this, one, that this uh, widget is going to hold. And we have a few different options here. One is to enable the survey theme. If I turn that off, you can see that we no longer have that uh, yellowish background. I can also choose to show the show other option, other UI elements like the options bar. So it should reflect, yep, my login state right there. You can just barely make that from, you, know, you can now see that here. And then you can see that we've enabled send data to the survey. So we've selected the map, and then we can select the source layer that that survey will receive information from. We can then choose to add a connection, and this is where we pass the data. So in this case, the zone field, and I could again see some of this by just looking here, parking zone, downtown. So I want the parking zone, go to that field. And then I would add the next field, which was our area. And as you might guess, these are all in order. So it makes it very easy for me to fill this out. Sub area, meter location. One unique aspect is I can also share the point, the shape, and say that that goes to the map question. So I'm passing in table information as well as the geometry into my form. And so I would basically fill out, I think it's about six or so in total uh, of these questions, parking zone, neighborhood, meter location, map, full ID, and configuration. And that's how we got this connected, the, this map connected to the form.
So we just saw how an existing application, the ArcGIS Experience Builder, is using the Survey123 JS API in its application to link a map with a survey. In order for you to get started creating your own application uh, that integrates with Survey123, there are a few basic requirements. The first, of course, would be to have a Survey123 form. And if you're just getting started, you don't necessarily need to have it completely filled out, but having at least a placeholder form that you, know, you can use to just make sure that positioning and such works correctly is enough to get started. As you start building your application and the application's integration with Survey123, the closer the form is to your production form, the form that you want people to actually fill out, the more effective you will be in terms of creating that integration between your application and the form. Needing to know such things as the field names of the questions uh, that, or the question names of the form so that you can appropriately pass values to and from or be able to monitor for when values change. Uh, knowing the type of choice options that someone could select so that if you want uh, your application to do something when a particular choice is selected, you're able to respond to that correctly. So obviously you need the form and you should have it fairly well designed, if not completely designed and ready for production. Um, second is that your web application needs to be registered with ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. Uh, when I talk about ArcGIS Online in uh, this seminar, um, I'm actually meaning either ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. Uh, sometimes I'll also just say ArcGIS Organization to encompass both of them. But uh, the JS API that you see here works equally well with ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, but you'll need to register your application with your ArcGIS organization to get a client ID. Hopefully, if you've done some web development with ArcGIS uh, before, this is not a new concept. Very, pretty much any application that interacts with the ArcGIS platform, be it online or enterprise, needs to be registered with that particular platform and you use a client ID to be able to you know, authorize your application when a user logs in to be able to uh, know that your application is authorized to use ArcGIS, the ArcGIS organization resources. And then finally, you would embed your web page in, or embed in your web page the beginnings uh, for the JS API. That obviously would require a script tag to reference the JS API. Uh, we also need a element somewhere in your web application to be able to display the form. Uh, this normally should be a block element and very typically will be a div HTML type element uh, that you know basically the form will be inserted into. Uh, and then finally, you'll need JavaScript that actually initializes the form uh, by creating what we call the Survey123 web form object. Just taking a look at the Hello World equivalent uh, for this, you can see that in this HTML, we have the script uh, that is loading the JS API from the Survey123 website in the head section of uh, the HTML page. And then in my body, you can see I have a div that will serve as my container for the web form. And then the script that, because it's in the body, will basically run at load, uh, at page load, that instantiates that new Survey123 web form, uses the client ID, sets the container to be the web form, and also sets the form ID. So hopefully this makes sense. We need the script, we need where the form is going to go, and we need the initialization code. Let's take a look at that take a look at this in a actual live and running website. So I'm going to be using CodePen uh, for several examples, and all of these pens are shared publicly. And um, you see the resource, the links um, in my demo slides, and we also have a list of them at the, um, you know, at the end of the presentation. So uh, don't worry necessarily about uh, frantically writing down gobbledygook URLs. Uh, we have them within the presentation, and we hopefully will give you enough time to write them down and uh, be able to view them later. So here you can see that I have pretty much what looks like a standard Survey123 form. It's taking up the full page. It's showing me signed in. Really doesn't look all that different from you know, when I share you a direct link to the form. However, this is actually being embedded. 
So you can see that in the HTML, we have a form div, and I've basically styled it to take the entire page uh, of the form. That's why, or the entire page of the web, web application. That's why you see it taking up the entire size, is just through the CSS. If I had set this down to 50, Um, or actually, let me just try a uh, actual pixel size there. Um, it should be resizing, my apologies. Um, always fun when you do demos live, isn't it? So you have the form div and we're loading the script. And then we can see the Survey123 web form work with the item ID, so the form that I'm loading, in this case, the store count form, the container, which is the form div, and then the client ID. And I received that client ID from ArcGIS Online. So you can see I'm logged in here to my developer dashboard at the ArcGIS developer site. And you can see that I have a code pen demo for a uh, code, dem code pen demo of JS API. That's a little hard to say quickly. I uh, here registered in my uh, or in my account. If I take a look, the client ID, lo and behold, it matches the one that I'm using. And if I were to edit this application, we can see that the redirect APIs or redirect URLs go to the CodePen resources, CodePen.io, and then it's CDPN.io short URL as well. So this is basic. This application is basically authorizing the CodePen website to use the Survey123 JS API using this client ID. So as we saw, there are three required properties that we need to initialize a Survey123 web form object with, the client ID, container, and item ID. These are all presented in a, uh, as an object, and you'll see in our documentation that we refer to them as options. These are required options, if you will. Um, we also have many additional options that you can initialize a web form with. I've broken them up into some broad categories. The first is data handling. So if you're using ArcGIS Enterprise, one option or one property that you'll need to put, provide in the options file is the portal URL. What ArcGIS Enterprise portal are you using uh, that holds the form as well as any other resources that you're uh, accessing as part of the web form API or web app API? Another are the two parameters of mode and global ID. These two parameters go together because they allow us to do more, uh, to set what your form is doing. By default, uh, a new a web form will be creating will create a new record when we submit into the J, when we submit the form. With the mode parameter, we can change that to have it view, edit, or copy the data of an existing record. In order to know which record we're viewing, editing, or copying. We need to specify the record's global ID using the global ID parameter. So if you're using the mode parameter, you also are using the global ID parameter to say which item you're doing the mode action to. Hopefully that makes sense. We also have the ability to override the default questions, uh, the default, default question values through the default question value parameter. And that will take um, an object that basically, or uh, yeah, that will take um, you know a set of uh, questions as well as the values that you want to supply to them. We also can initialize the form to not submit data to the feature service. We've seen several instances where a author wants to use a form more or less, more or less like a scratch pad or a in-application calculator, if you will. So by setting the is disabled submit to feature service, a user will be able to interact with the form just as if it's a regular form, but when they press the submit button, the data won't be stored in ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, so again, this is useful if you're using that form 
more or less for an in-application purpose. There's no real need to submit the data. And finally, you can pass a uh, token from uh, your application into the web form. We'll talk about this later, but this is required if you're going to be using a form that is not shared publicly. We also have uh, uh, two parameters that help work with display of the form. The first is the hide elements. So we can specify particular form elements to hide. Um, this works very similarly to the hide URL parameter, uh, and that can include navigation, uh, form navigation components such as the navigation bar, the header, the footer. Uh, it can also be hide the theme. We saw that with Experience Builder where we turned off that yellow background. And we can also hide individual questions. We can also set the width internally by providing a value in pixels. And then finally, we can register some event handlers at form load. We can also register these event handlers after, after the form is loaded through um, basically a set function for each of these events. But we can also begin a web form with these already attached. And so the events that we can subscribe to are when a form is loaded, when a question value is changed, when a form is submitted, and when the form is resized. So we can act on those various actions. And that allows us to capture most of the life cycle, as I said, of a uh, person interacting with the form. So with that, let's take some of these options and complicate up our form. So I'm actually gonna move over to a second code pen, which we'll save at the end uh, so that you see it all with, with all the additional options that we're gonna provide. But at this point, this looks very much like the last code pen that we did with, where we've simply loaded the form and that we can see that the form here exists within the entire uh, web page. The first thing I want to do is pass a value into the form. So you see that we have the store ID field here. So normal, one, you know, just like we saw with the uh, experience builder, it's very common for that host application to provide values into the form so that the user doesn't need to like manually copy and paste from clicking on the map and then bring into the form. So I'm going to update the store ID. In this case, I'll update the store ID with a set value, though you could see probably, you, know, you should be able to see how this could easily be incorporated into a program, uh, into a JS API just through some variable substitution. So I've used that default question value parameter and I've set store ID to 10. And you can see that we now have the store ID is set to 10. If I, if I set that to say 100, code pen will reload and we now have 100. Very often, you're not going to want the user to fill in or be able to alter the field that you've provided this information for. So the next thing we're gonna do is start hiding elements. So the first thing that I'll hide is the theme, just so that it becomes a fairly blank background here. And you can see that that automatically hides the theme. I'm then going to hide the nav bar so that they really can't sign themselves out. That would be probably very unfortunate if they could sign themselves out. And then finally, we'll hide that field. So we've got, again, that's the store ID field. And the, the syntax for hiding a particular field is field colon the name of the field. So now you can see that we no longer have the store ID present. So we've been able to set the value for the store ID and then hide that along with, whoops, along with the theme and nav bar. The final modification I'm going to make is provide a function for when the form loads. So again, that was that started with an on form load loaded uh, parameter. And you'll see that we have the window.alert go hello form, and the window goes hello form. 
So we've got the function going. I'm going to put in a slightly more complicated function here. And just if you're not familiar with this, this is a syntax for an anonymous function that's passing in a basically a data element that the window, and then we have this particular function fire. Oops, there we go. So what I'm going to do now is enlarge that a little bit because this function is a little large. Place in a function that checks to see if the browser supports geolocation. And if it does, it requests the current position, just as we see here. And when we get the position, we'll set the geo point with the X and Y. We'll talk about this function actually in the next section, but we're basically setting the X and Y location of our form when we press, you know, when, you know, when the form loads. So we'll allow, and apparently I need to open my system preferences and allow Chrome to have access to my location. No, it's got access, so we'll be fine for now. So now we'll save this for the code pen and come back to the presentation. So we just saw creating a set of default options that fire when the form loads to set values to questions to alter the display of the form itself and to uh, and to have a function that fires when the form is loaded and then provides the response of that function into the form. So as you saw a little bit with that last on form loaded function, we also have a series of methods that we can use within the JS API to be able to interact with the form. The, you know, as you saw, we can set the, you know, the geo point question, but we also have functions to set basically any type of question. So we've got set question value for non map questions. We've got set geometry and set geo point for various map questions. Question value, as you can see, takes an object so you can provide multiple question values at the time of the interaction. The set geometry can take geometry objects in a variety of formats, be it an Esri JSON uh, or Esri geometry JSON, a GeoJSON, or the XLS form format, which is a sequence of coordinates. Um, and then we also have set GeoPoint as a helper value for just X and Y. We also can set style, so we can provide a um, series of CSS commands uh, and or CSS directives and further um, I customize the styling of the form. We can also alter the mode of the form. So we can go from creating a new record or viewing a record to editing that record simply by toggling the set mode function to switch out what type of mode we're working with. And then finally, we can actually replace the form that we're viewing with set item ID. Uh, so if your application's overall workflow would make benefit uh, or would be would it would be beneficial for multiple forms to be displayed at different points in your application's lifecycle you can easily reuse that same the that same uh 3123 container uh to display different forms at different points within the life cycle so let's now take a look at a little bit more app interaction so this one, this uh, web page looks a little bit more complicated. We've got a bit more going on here. We have a div to the right and the left. In this case, basically serving as big buttons. Um, you can see here, I have a div that basically has an on-click event. So it's essentially functioning as if a as if it's a button. That's minus one and plus one. I also have this button here to open the form. So in the previous examples, the forms have been loaded pretty much when the page, or the forms have been loaded when the page loads, right? We, this line here to create that new web form fires right at the beginning of, uh, right, at the be right in line on the, form, on the web page load. In this case, 
the form load will happen once I click the button. So if you take a look, if I click the button that says init, first thing that it does is hide the button and then it will load the form. And you can see the web form statement here is now within that, um, it's within that, within this function. So one thing I wanted to highlight is that the form doesn't have to load at the very beginning uh, when a web page loads. You can actually also control the lifecycle of the form, uh, you know, for when the web page loads, by you know, within your own application as well. So I'll click that button. That button hides, and we have a form that loads. And you can see that we're hiding quite a few elements here: the theme, navbar, title, and store ID, and that we've initialized the person count at zero. You can see that the minus one div and the plus one div both use this adjust count function when they are clicked. So looking at the adjust count, we're storing a count variable inside of the overall web application. We're sanity checking to make sure it'll be greater than zero. And then we'll update the count with that. So if I click plus here, you can see with every click, the value increases. Over here, it decreases. And if I click again, as you can see, sort of like when it gets highlighted, I'm not going below zero. So we're just doing some basic interaction between the web application with these buttons essentially, and the form, passing the value from the web application into the form. I also want to highlight another, uh, another application. So this is an application that my colleague John Grayson at the uh, Geo Experience Center wrote as part of a sort of an initial demonstration of the JS API. It's going to do a couple of things. It's going to run a speed test. And once the speed test is complete, you'll see that it's going to ask for my location. And because I've got the system preferences blocked, it's not passing it through, but normally it would pass the location through. But it's also passing my internet speed. So I can then provide my response and submit. So we ran an internet speed test and then passed the results into a form. This is the web application code that John wrote to do this. I'm going to go into the app and the main.js. And we can see here that the first function, which is the initialize, create, you know, finds the speed test button. When that is clicked, we then run the speed test. And once the speed test is run, we disable the button and create the web form. And once the form is loaded, pass the data in, and then also request location. So again, we're using that set question value to pass the data inside and set geopoint to set the location once that data is present, or once the location is present. So, We've just seen work a application that integrates the Survey123 WebAppJS API in a couple of different methods. The one is a little bit more of an interactive you know, application where a user clicks and the application responds to that event and then passes the, you know, essentially the effect of that event into the web form. The other one is a little bit more procedural where the user clicks and then a longer process occurs. And then as a result of that longer process, the speed test, the data is then passed into the form. So we've seen a number of different ways that we can begin using the JS API to embed a form and then customize that for how that form interacts and looks within your own web application. Wanted to provide a few considerations as you go about developing the JS, developing with the JS API. The first is that this works with public surveys by default. 
Um, I mentioned that one of those optional parameters that we can pass in uh, with a Survey123 web form is a token. And this is where that would be needed. Survey123, the Survey123 web app JSA API is embedding the form inside of an iframe. And it is a security worst practice uh, to have login occur via an iframe. In fact, most browsers will block that as a security no-go. So in order, if you have a private survey that you want to integrate with your application, you will need to have your application log, log the user in and then pass the token into Survey123. As it happens, you've already registered your application with your ArcGIS organization, be it ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise, in order to be able to use the Survey123 Web App JS API. So you already have everything in place to let a user log in you just need to add the login code into your own application. The other thing I'll mention is that the on-form submitted event, um, if you're using that uh, or uh, you know, to process the data when the user commit, you know, clicks on the submit button, depending on your survey, you will have a very, you will have a fairly complex object to process. And that's because the on-form submitted creates what we call a feature set object. Uh, and that is because a form may consist of multiple discrete records that get written into a feature service. Um, this is the case when we have repeats, uh, particularly. So if I had a form that has a repeat section and that has two repeats within it, I'm actually submitting three records. One record for the parent portion of the form and then one record for each of those repeats. So you, you, if you're used to Survey123, you're probably not surprised by this because for every repeat, we create an additional layer or table in your feature service because you know, repeats are stored as discrete features inside a feature service. So just be aware when you're processing your data, you know, be aware of your data structure as you develop your application. One of the benefits of using the Web App JS API is that you can really closely tailor a application to work against a specific data structure and so you should be aware of these as you know as part of developing your web application just wanted to also mention that we are by no means complete with the web app js api there are based on customer requests customer interest we are looking at providing uh, additional methods and capabilities within the js api a few that we're working on is being able to have the web application trigger the submission event so that the user doesn't click the submit button. You know in your application when the data in the survey is finalized and then can submit the data at that point in time. We also, uh, as opposed to just simply subscribing to the on question value changed event, we also are providing a direct method to query a question's value at any arbitrary point in your application. Um, so that you'll have uh, you know, access to that. Also being able to you know, populate a complete form. Uh, and that includes, again, as I was sort of describing with uh, a repeat with multiple features, being able to basically provide all of the, you know, provide that complex object into the form. And that ties in with being able to address repeat values. Right now there's a limitation that uh, you really can't directly act, you have, there is difficulty accessing repeat values directly within the application. So I wanted to provide some uh, presentation resources and we'll see these, uh, I'll switch back a little bit to show a couple of them, but um, we have a number of different resources. The first is the Web App JS API documentation, uh, which is in the ArcGIS developer site, as well as the Esri community blog that introduced the Web App JS API. Uh, I've also provided links to the samples that we see here as well as um, a general Survey123 resource, which is the Survey123 Resource Center. So I'm going to just move over. Um, now in the ArcGIS Developer section, aside from the direct link, we can get to the JS API by going to the App Builder and Templates section with Survey123, and then go to the API reference, the Web App API reference. I also can find it here and we can see the JS, the JS API reference get started. Here is our Survey123 web form object. Again, with that very basic, with the client ID, container, and item ID, along with the options that are supported. 
And then you can see the full set of functions here on the right. So you can see the set item ID. So it sets the item ID, notes that the frame will be reloaded. And here you can see the options that we've all, that we've talked about in this presentation. Esri Community Site, again, within the ArcGIS Server 123 blog, is the introduction to the Server 123 Web App JS API that describes the JS API and also talks a little bit more about the demo uh, that our my colleague John uh, created. And then finally, the Arc 3123 Resource Center um, is a great stop, uh, one stop for getting more information around 3123. It has direct links to the help topics. As well as additional resources, links to the blogs, what's new, featured blogs, featured documentation topics. So that's like a commonly asked question or commonly asked subject area, as well as a series of videos uh, that range from customer stories to uh, our presentations and conferences, as well as uh, tutorials that can help you get started using various parts of Survey123. Again, that Surrey 3 Resource Center is a great place to get started, but you will also find several videos um, available within the Surrey 1 3 uh, playlist in YouTube, as well as uh, getting more information via either our help documentation or the blog at Esri Community. If you have questions, I certainly encourage you to uh, raise them in the Surrey 1 3 uh, group within the Esri Community website. Uh, we, the entire Surrey 1 3 team is very active um, and at responding to customer questions within there. So with that, um, I'll be happy to take any questions uh, that people have. All right, well, thank you, James. Um, we're now going to begin answering some questions submitted during today's presentation. We received a few and we will get through them um, and whatever we may not get to today, we will be happy to address in the Esri Community blog post after this webinar. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through your questions pane in your attendee control panel. Um, our first question here is, can logical rules be written into the JavaScript that can cause later survey questions and selection options to change dynamically based on answers uh, on earlier questions? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so um, the Survey123 JS API is designed to control sort of externally the interaction of the application. You certainly can, within your own application, write um, the logic that would either monitor a question's answer uh, and then alter additional questions uh, within. However, I would suggest that it's more efficient writing that type of code within the form itself. So every one, two, three is a you know supports what we call smart forms, and part of that smartness is being able to have a calculation occur on a question in response to other question types. So you can actually do that before authoring your own application. It can be already done within the form itself. However, I could see use cases uh, that would require it to occur within the, um, with, via the, your own web application. All right, great, thanks James. Um, is this API available for existing JavaScript frameworks like Vue or React instead of just using Dojo? Um, so that's a very good question. Uh, this JS API actually isn't biased uh, to an existing framework like you know React or Angular or Dojo or Vue. Um, it, it's very it, you know it it doesn't require any of those. It doesn't use any of those. So it, it's more of a pure JavaScript API uh, in that sense. Um, it, I will say we don't have wrappers for Dojo or Angular or React, but as you should see it pretty much is very easy to get started just, you know, by creating that one web form object and then working with that. All right, great. And our last question, are there any hands-on tutorials or training classes where we can build some skills for fully exercising the capabilities of this API? 
so at this point in time, we don't have um, a uh, learn lesson or tutorial in that sense. That's a very good idea for us to pursue in the future. Um, we have been sharing, you know, we have been making the, you know, examples such as these code pens uh, that I have, that we have for this uh, seminar available as a way for you to be able to be at least begin and start working with a form and start, you know, modifying things so that you can become comfortable with the JS API. Okay, we actually had one more question that came in. Um, so this person is going to be attending um, Ezra's user conference. Are there any sessions that they should look out for um, at UC that might pertain to this topic or any information um, that they can find? Yes. Um, so first, I'll make a quick mention also, uh, since uh, the videos have been recorded and are available on YouTube, is we did have an extending Survey123 session at the Developer Summit that also covered uh, the JS API, um, I guess much in the same level as we did here. Um, the other, um, and then also the um, Survey123, uh, I don't, ha I should have brought the title with me, but it's, um, it's the Survey123 uh, web, uh, web focused session uh, will uh, also cover the JS API, again, in some brief detail because it's going to be covering many aspects of creating and working with web forms, um, it, you know, that, you know, or creating and working with web forms. My apologies. I sort of trailed there. Okay. Great. Uh, a couple more came in. Um, can the JavaScript API help with approval routing? Um, so that's an interesting question. I'm, I would maybe need to see the workflow that you're thinking about uh, with regards to an approval routing. Um, certainly, I can envision a system that a user filling in an application um, you know, then submits, and certainly, like we've seen people embed with dashboard, um, you know, using uh, the form as an ended in context. So, I can say in a general perspective, yes. But in order to dive into sort of details of how you, that would envision what the workflow you're considering, I probably would need to know more details about the workflow. Um, I would say that if you're interested in pursuing that, um, feel free to. Uh, contact us after uh, the session. I think Amy will be providing her email and from and then she can forward that onward. Um, and we could perhaps talk about that because there are also other technologies or other um, other designs that could also be used with approval routing that do not require the JS API as well. So it could be an appropriate solution, but depending on the workflow, I could also see it not being the best solution. Okay, we have another question. Is the API available as an install from NPM, like the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, instead of using it from the CDN? So it is available with the Survey123 uh, local website installer. Um, if you're not aware, uh, we uh, have recently uh, made available a local install of the Survey123 website. Uh, that's available via my Esri, uh, so that and this is primarily designed to serve um, organizations that have firewall restrictions against using external resources uh, with their ArcGIS Enterprise organization. So it is possible to install the JS API via the um, website, via the local install of the website. We don't have a separate install at this point in time. If there's, in, if you have interest in a separate install, definitely would like to hear about that uh, so that we could consider that in the future. Okay, and I think this is our last question. I learn best with runnable samples. Will there be more created on the website or in a GitHub repo? Um, th yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a very good question. I think to the extent possible, we are trying to create runnable samples. Um, you know, for example, with Python, we very enthusiastically have uh, you know begun working with Python notebooks to d demonstrate how we can uh, do integrations. That's part of um, the uh, the impetus for me using CodePen, uh, which is a runnable JavaScript environment uh, for these uh, demonstrations. Um, if there's, um, you know, if there's a more appropriate solution, um, we may be able to research that and provide one, provide that a little bit better. But um, we have been working to provide 
these types of samples within our documentation and we may just need to sort of fill some of that out a bit more. All right. Well, James, we have a few minutes left. Do you have any closing thoughts or anything else you'd like to, to share? I think I'm actually pretty good at this point. Um, I, hopefully this served, uh, you know, this served as a good introduction to the Survey 123 JS API and showed how you, know, you can begin using Survey 123 within your own web applications, not just, you know, creating the forms and, you know, giving a person a link on the website to go, go over and fill out the form. Awesome. Well, thank you, James, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, Introduction to the ArcGIS Survey123 Web App JavaScript API. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me using my email address that will come in your following follow-up email. Once you leave today's webinar, you will also receive a survey on the presentation, and it, we would greatly appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. Uh, we will be providing a recording of this presentation. Uh, which will be available within seven to ten business days on the GeoDev webinar landing page where you registered on behalf of Esri and our presenter. Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.